I'm sorry for the delay. It happens. And well, my name, as you know, is Liarno Fiori. I am a um, clinical neurophysiologist, which means neurophysiology applied to clinical diagnostic methods. So as you know, in neurology, uh, we have two kinds of di diagnostic methods. Some are anatomic, anatomical, like, uh, for example, a brain tomography, and some are functionals. So we're studying the function of the brain, of the cortex, in time, because it's not something fixed, it's something that changes over time. And that is one of the, one of the things that is important in EEG, is that it varies over time, so an exam must always be long, more than 30 minutes, at least 30 minutes. So basically, very simple, an EEG is a graph, right, I need two points, and then uh, so I can register the difference in voltage, then this is amplified and it goes on to a pen that designs a graph. So what do you have? You have on the uh, X line, time, and on the Y line, the difference of voltage between two points over the cortex. So remember that EEG, what, when you say EEG, it's very important to remember that the electrodes are on the scalp, okay, on the, we call it couro cabeludo. Um, if, uh, so there are superficial electrodes. If you need a deeper electrode or one over the cortex, then you have an implant or an electrocorticogram. So by definition, the EEG is with electrodes on the patient's scalp. So what do you use? You use yeah, electrodes? Yeah. Wait. O se puede dar ahí ocultar para tirar ese cosillo que tiene ahí en el medio. Ocultar. Okay. Yes. Very good. So what you use are these surface electrodes, right? They are convex. They have a, a, like a dome, like an aboboda. No? And then on the other side, you have the jackbox, which we call a cabezote, where you're going to put the electrodes that correspond to each area of the brain. And all this goes to a monitor. Um, well, the electrode placement, there's a, uh, there's a technique to do it, which we call the International 1020 System. I'm sure when you read papers, they always say we use the International 1020 System. So it's the following. There are special points which we, you will measure, and then you uh, see which, which, which point uh, you're going to put the electrodes, and I'll show later how this is done. And so basically, you, we always tie up hair in little squares. They don't do this outside, but it helps a lot. And then you mark the points, and you take the electrodes with a little bit of conductive paste, and you can fix them. We used to use collodium, but nobody does that anymore, so we use this kind of, of tape. Well, so the electroencephalogram, by definition, right, it studies the electrical activity of the cerebral cortex in time. So it's a graph, voltage, right, electrical activity versus time. It can be uh, conventional, which is a visual analysis, right, which is this. This is a visual analysis. It's a pattern recognition. So uh, to make things easier, I put left side as red and right side is blue. So you can see there's a pattern recognition. Opa. If you look at this side, it's different from this side. There's something here that you, you recognize as something different. And if you think that it's easy to teach that to computers, not yet, it's not so easy. So this is the conventional visual analysis. You can have, you can collect data analogically or with numbers, digital. Then there's something that we here in Brazil, we call mapeamento, which is meant to be brain mapping. But when you look uh, uh, at literature, brain mapping is mu much more than just uh, this kind of map, right? Which we, people like to do it because you can, you can ask more for the patient, but it has no use whatsoever for clinical um, studies. So, what it is, is a quantitative analysis, and you need, of course, if you're going to uh, make graphs and, and study numbers, you have to have a digital data collection. What else is good about the electroencephalogram? 
It can be an outpatient exam. You come in, you do the exam in, in two hours. You can take it to an intensive care un unit. But remember that there is a minimum time of at least 30 minutes. So by the time you put all the electrodes, you do the 30 minutes, you take out the electrodes, two hours have gone by. So this is the visual analysis, and this is the mapping, which is of no use in the clinical practice. It's just so, you know, to make it look prettier. What it's, it is used for is, for example, here when you do a mapping, is for uh, mathematical studies, correlations, graphs, etc. Now, as everything, right, the uh, EEG, you have the, um, in time, you have the um, frequency, how many times um, the wave is going to os oscillate in time. So when you have, these are the basic rhythms of the electroencephalogram. So most, most known of all is alpha, which is between 8 and 13 or 8 and 12. Then the fast one is beta over 13, and some people called gamma over 30, except that this difference between gamma and beta cannot be seen by the eye, by the naked eye, human eye. Then you've got the very slow one, the delta, from 1 to 4 hertz, and in between alpha and delta, you've got theta. So what's important about using, for example, this, having a digital uh, collection of data? is that, remember, like everything, we always have a spectrum that we can analyze. So I can analyze this spectrum, I can see the difference, but if it gets too close, I won't be able to see it. Or if it's too slow, I won't know if it's half or a half, a one, a 0 0.75 or whatever. These little nuances can only be seen when you use a digital uh, collection. So um, remember that light, right, that you have the, you have, ultraviolet and infrared, and you have the visible spectrum. Same thing with sound. There's a spectrum in which we can hear, and if it's very high pitched, we don't, or very low pitched, only some animals do. Same thing with the first equipment. They weren't capable of registering things that were too fast or too slow because of the limitation of the equipment, okay, and of, of what we are able to see with our naked eye. Right, so this is the, the equipment the way it used to be, you had these pens, and they would draw out the, the graph. Now everything is easier, you do it by computer, and these pens were terrible, they always got clogged up, filled with, with ink, and then you had to change one, and it was really expensive. Okay, this is Hans Berger. Uh, the first person actually to do uh, electroencephalogram on animals was Caton on uh, fel felines, right, cats. But Hans Berger was the first that tried on humans. And he, he described the alpha rhythm in canines, in dogs. Well, in humans, right after the First World War, you had lots of humans without, without a piece of their skull, of their cranium. So it was easier with the limitations of equipment to be able to register uh, cortical activity. And then this couple, Gibbs and Gibbs, they started studying patients with epilepsy from the 30s to the 50s. So virtually everything we know nowadays of um, electroencephalogram, frequency, what's epileptic form, what isn't, what's sleep, what's wake, everything, they, this couple um, described it. Okay, so what you have, you need uh, to make this graph, right? You need the difference of voltage between two electrodes at least for every every channel so you've got several channels but each channel shows the difference between two electrodes so you've got two inputs and one oops and one output okay and then you have the recording pen and the, the paper was always moving so uh, it is established that for EEG one second will be three centimeters of paper if you're doing a sleep study for example you can make this smaller, more com compact, and the amplitude is equal to the, the voltage, the difference of voltage between two, two points. So what we have, oh, here in one second, how many times does this oscillate? So we've got those same rhythms already talked about. Alpha, see in one second, this oscillates if you count it 10 times, so it's in the alpha range. When it's very fast, 
it's beta, right? When it's very slow, delta, and in between alpha and delta, you've got theta. And you say, why? Why theta, theta? That's not in, it's not in the order of the alphabet. The reason is because it was um, described in the temporal lobe. And this measure more or less of like seven millimeters, 50 microvolts. So that's more or less the amplitude of the alpha rhythm. So if something is around the amplitude of the alpha rhythm, which would be 50 microvolts, we say it's got medium amplitude. Over this high amplitude, under this low amplitude. Okay, so you see it's a pattern recognition again, right? Beta is the fast one, alpha between 8 and, and 12 or 8 and 13, theta between 4 and 8, and delta between 1 and 3 or 1 and 4, okay, in time. So what is, how do you do the EEG? You have to have a sequence, right? Every channel, you've got here eight channels, one, two, three, four, and right all the way down. And in one second, you're going to have the rhythm that oscillates. And remember that in, in, this, um, in this example, one second is three centimeters of paper and the voltage, 50 microvolts will fit in uh, five or, or seven millimeters. So what do they do? You, every channel is the difference between two points. So this channel one, it's between prefrontal and frontal, then two frontal central, central parietal, parietal occipital. And see that this on the left side, all the numbers are uh, impar, odd. And on the right side, all numbers are um, but uh, odd and I think it's, I forgot the name, but these are the, um, the odd numbers and this, I don't know how you call it, but it's the paris, par y impar. I don't know if it's the same in Spanish. And yeah. then on the yeah. other side, sorry? Yeah, pair, pair, misma cosa. Ah, par y impar. Par y impar, okay. <laughs> And so on the other side, you're going to make the same sequence. See, this one with this one, this one with this one, and so on. And you see that, therefore, I, I am um, comparing the left side to the right side. We always do this, left side and right side. And always from front to back, from frontal to occipital. And you see the sequence is the same on one side and the other. Therefore, I can compare them. For example, you see here an occipital. You've got that lovely alpha rhythm, which happens when the adult person is, because children can be different, is awake and relaxed with eyes closed. You see the alpha rhythm here is more or less the same, right, uh, on one side and the other. So you're always comparing and the sequence has to be the same. And another thing I'd like to point out is that the first electrode is always a full line and the second is a pointed line. But then on the next one, uh, this frontal was the second, and now it's going to be the first. Central was second, and now first, and there's a reason for that. Okay, so this is how you call, you name the electrodes, right? So frontal polar, uh, left and right, then uh, the middle, Z for zero, frontal, central, right over the central sulcus, and parietal. Um, then you've got the frontals left and right, central, left and right, parietal, left and right, and the occipital. And these over here on the side, these are the temporal um, electrodes. So it's anterior, mid, temporal, and posterior, okay? And there's a technique, this is the 1020 system, which you will see soon how it's done. Okay, just for those that are not acquainted with seizures, seizures can be epileptic seizures, right? They can have a focal onset when they start in only one part of the brain or a generalized onset when they start in the whole brain all by the whole cortex is involved from the beginning. And another, I would also like to, to make clear some, some uh, terms like ictal is during the seizure, we call it critical, also in Portuguese. Interictal is between one it's the period between one seizure and the other. Post-dictal is after the, um, the seizure. 
either immediate or more later. And preictal is just before the seizure, and prodromal is a long time before the seizures. So um, here he uh, we're seeing the phases of the seizure, right? So this would be uh, the aura is something the patient feels. You do not see. It's not a motor manifestation or something you can see. It's something the patient says, feels, right? Like butterflies in the stomach or this cold feeling going up from the stomach to the head. Then you've got in a normal tonic-clonic seizure, I mean, normal, uh, very common uh, tonic-clonic seizure, you would have the tonic phase, the clonic phase, and then the postictal phase, which usually the patient falls asleep. Okay, so once we know that we have generalized and focal, this is uh, an electroencephalogram of an interictal generalized activity, right? So that all the cortex is involved, but this is not a seizure, it is just one element, which is, I always say that it's like a spark and the seizure is the, uh, the fire. So this is just like a blip, right? It's just a spark, not yet the, the fire, or let's say just a tremor, not yet the earthquake. So, oops, this can be generalized, both sides, right? Or it can be something restricted, a focus, right? Which we used to call partial. And here you see on one side, remember, right is blue and left is red. There's this epileptiform activity. I know it's epileptiform because it's pointed and it shows up from the rest. It's, um, and it's only on one side, on the left side. And then you've got ictal versus interictal. So this is the interictal activity, as you can see, generalized, okay, the whole cortex. And when you have the seizure, this goes on in time and has like a progression and evolution in time. And this so would be the spark, the faisca, and this would be the fire. This is when it's generalized. And when it's focal, see, you have here a focal interictal activity. And during the seizure, this will progress but you can see it's restricted to one side. Okay, so this is a focal seizure. And what defines the seizure is the time this, this activity lasts and, of course, what, whatever comes along clinically, what you observe in the patient. Okay, so the EEG protocol, why does it have to be at least 30 minutes? Because you have to do lots of things since it's a dynamic exam. Uh, so first, what we do is you ask the patient resting to open and close his eyes. And this is, has a reason because the, the, uh, the alpha rhythm that's occipital, uh, we call it posterior dominant rhythm. Usually it's in the alpha range. That would be normal. When you open your eyes, it's suppressed. When you close your eyes, it appears again. So this is what we call uh, reactivity. It has a good reactivity, right? If you're in a coma, this doesn't happen. So, and the other... Uh, activation is hyperventilation, okay, and you have you ask the patient to hyperventilate for three to five minutes, and this sometimes can bring out a, an absent seizure in, in seizure in children or uh, some other uh, modification. Then you've got the photostimulus, intermittent photostimulus, meaning that you have this stroboscopic light, and it has fixed stimuli that that keeps increasing. Then, of course, we want to see the patient awake and the patient sleeping, because most epileptiform activity is seen in sleep or during this transition from um, awake to sleep. The sleep can be spontaneous or induced. You can use drugs like um, uh, sedatives. Uh, another activation is sleep deprivation. Why is this important? First, because the patient is going to sleep. Great. And also because if, when you're sleep deprived, you're always in a bad mood, it means you're irritated and it also means that your, uh, cortical, um, uh, your cortical cells are uh, more unstable, so you, you, it's easier to see some, some activities in some kinds of epilepsy. And the sensory stimuli, tactile, sound, etc. So this takes, like, especially when you wait, wait for the patient to sleep and wake up, it takes around 30 minutes. Okay. So remember the pattern recognition, the alpha rhythm from 8 to 13 that you see occipitally. It can be like, you know, an ad for a, for a pen, for an ink pen, or it can be in um, 
what we call fusos. It's the um, spindles, right? I don't know. In Spanish, probably it's fusos also. And if in old people, especially, the, sometimes the alpha rhythm is so has such a low voltage that you really can't can't count. Then you've got the theta, which is either in children because their their brain is not yet completely mature, or in sleeping adults. The slow one is the delta, so also in children or in adults sleeping. What what phase of sleep would this be? Slow wave sleep, right? And here you've got spikes. So you've got a spike wave, spike wave, spike wave. And if you count in one second, you've got three of these. So we call it the spike wave complexes, three hertz, which is typical of the what they call epilepsy petit mal, which actually is the uh, childhood absence, right? When this is generalized, you've got um, a diagnosis of uh, childhood uh, absence epilepsy. Okay, so what are we, we trying to, to register? Now, you, you have the cortex, right? And then between the cortex and the scalp, the skin, there are lots of things in the way, right? There's uh, liquid, there's skull, uh, the meninges, etc., etc. So this is why it has to be amplified, right? So you can study the cortex. But, of course, you're going to put the electrodes only on the, uh, the convex parts of the skull, of the cranium. So all this part, the base and inside the sulci, is not registered by these superficial electrodes. That's when you come in with a surgeon that will put in implant a deep electrode. Uh, so when, when we describe a focus, we always say it's projected. Let's say the focus is here. Yes, it's projected here. It doesn't mean it starts here, but this is where the electrode sees it. And well, what do we register when we register the electroencephalogram. What is the cortical activity? So remember, now when you have um, a, a brain cell, a neuron, what kinds of electrical activity do you have? You've got a resting potential, a membrane potential, the potential action potential, and between, right, between the neurons you've got, oops, you've got the postsynaptic potentials. They can be excitatory or they can be uh, inhibitory. So when this, the scientists started probing to see which um, activity corresponded to what you see on the surface, they realized that you have to have a minimum of neurons having the same electrical activity so you can register. And the surface area, the minimum, is like six centimeters, uh, square centimeters of, of uh, brain, of cortex. So and what are the neurons that are all together, right, like these? It, the famous pyramidal neurons, all right? And they're big. And what happens when you have, especially the upper layers, you have very dense synapses and uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials can occur. So when you have a group of them all together, what do you have? You have a rhythm, right? Because of this layered structure and because they're all together pointing the same way like a palisade right um whatever you put when you put a um, an electrode on the surface you can see that they are synchronized if enough neurons are synchronized you will have a pattern well this is what usually you see in a neuron it's a dipole right but when you put the see this is the the brain so you've got the brain with the pyramidal neurons, then you've got the skull, the electrodes. So if they're all pointing the same way, there's going to be a negative surface. And this is what the, uh, what the electrode is going to register. Okay. So if you've got two groups of uh, pyramidal neurons, one has a positive surface and the other one a negative surface. So what happens? This electrode will have a different electronegativity from uh, electrical activity from this one. This one is more negative relative to this one. And this is the electrode on the scalp. Okay, and this is where the electrodes go, right? Remember the names of the electrodes? Huh? So this is FZ, CZ, PZ, right? And if you see, uh, they're all here in the midline. And then you have the frontals, right? Frontal F3, F4, which are here, right, the frontal ones. 
Then you've got the central ones, C3 and C4, which are these, right? And here's the omega that shows that this is the, the central sulcus, right? This one. Then parietal here and here and occipital. And these on the side, these are the temporal electrodes, right? Anterior, mid and posterior, right? So this is what we have, right? But now, uh, this is how we used to call them. We used, we used to call them T3, T4, T5, and T6. Now, as usual in the medicine, the orders have to change names. Uh, so they changed this one to T7 and T8 and P7, P8, because it's in the line, the same line. It doesn't make any difference. It's a question of uh, naming. Okay, so remember that when I have an electrode that is seeing something that's let's say here it's 100% negative, there's something called an electrical field, which means that all the other electrodes that are, that are nearby are also going to register some negative activity, although the further away you get, the less uh, negative it will be, because most fo focus, uh, foci are negative relatively to, to the rest. Okay, so why is this? Because this is the biggest stadium in the world, in, in Brazil, and we're very proud of it. And, but no, the meaning is the following. Let's suppose, let's think, this is a cortex, right? And every little person here is a neuron. So let's say there's a reporter outside of the stadium, right? Uh, yes, here, everybody is saying something different, right? It's completely desynchronized. So the reporter that's outside, he only will hear zoom, 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 right? Then, if a small group starts singing together or doing something together, the reporter that is, let's say I put reporters all around, the one that's nearest to this group will hear it better than anybody else. And this is why, because they are excessive and synchronized, which is exactly what epileptic activity is, excessive and synchronized. And what happens? So this is focal, right? Eventually, this can spread to all the rest, like an ola. And if you have a goal, the whole stadium will, will get up and scream all at the same time. So this would be the generalized activity. It's just so that you uh, make an analogy to understand a little better. Okay, and this is the 1020 system. Uh, how do you measure? Because all, not all heads are the same, but their proportion is more or less the same. So you make measurements and then you use 10% or 20% of the measure. So the first measure goes from the nasium to the inion and the other one from one preauricular point to the other side, right? So you've got this. First, you've got from the nasium to the inion, so that's 100%. The middle, 50%, is where you're going to put CZ, right? And then you get 20, 20, 10. That makes 50, right? 20, 20, 10, 50. Okay, same thing from one year to the other. So 10%. Uh, 20, 20, and so on. Then, so the, these are the two main lines, sagittal and transverse. Then you will get the 10% line here, here, and here, and you're going to draw another line going around the head in the same where the 10% points are, and this is going to be the temporal, okay? So sagittal, uh, transverse, and temporal. So what you have in the end is this, see? You've got in the middle, CZ, then 20% FZ, 20% PZ. We don't use this one. And then here, 20%, 20% of the measure, right? And then you get, for, for the third one, you're going to get 10% FP1, another 20%, F7, 20%, T3, etc., etc. Okay, so what do you have? You have all these planes. You have the frontal polar plane, the frontal plane, central plane, parietal plane, and the occipital pl uh, plane. And then you've got parasagittal, sorry, the middle, sagittal, right parasagittal, and left parasagittal. And then you've got the left temporal and right temporal. So when, you, when somebody says, oh, there's a, there's a parasagittal activity, it's somewhere in one of these electrodes that are not in the middle and are not temporal either. Okay, so 
you ask me, you can ask me the following. Why is it that you have CZ and C3? Why is it not C1, right, or C2? Because this is the 1020 system. When you use the 1010 system, then yes, you've got the C1, C2, etc. But you do these electrodes, the the re registration overlaps, you see one, so you don't need this much. It will be terrible to have to glue all these and measure all these electrodes, and this is enough for what we need in clinical medicine. If you're going to use one of these, you might as well use, this is for uh, quantitative analysis, then you have a special cap for that. Okay, but this is not uh, uh, what we are seeing right now. And then you've got the programs or montages, which is how you're going to distribute the electrodes, right? So. As we have seen, we had the parasagittal and parasagittal. So I can take um, each one, each of these numbers is a channel. So this one and this one, then this one and this one and so on in a sequence. So you're going to do a temporal sequence, parasagittal sequence, temporal sequence and a parasagittal sequence. And what do what is this kind of program or montage called? It looks like two little bananas, so it's the double banana. That's the program we most use because it gives you a good uh, insight of, of the whole, whole brain from front to back. Then, right, this is the double banana. Then you can also use the tiaras, right, or the transverse um, program. So on channel one, this one with this one, on channel two, this one with this one, and so on, right? And uh, there's one thing I'd like to point out is that here, and this channel, both electrodes are, um, they're, they're um, seeing, uh, it's, uh, the voltage is, uh, is they're like active, right? So we call this bipolar, right? And uh, the first one and the second one are always active. Oh, then you can, because uh, if you use one electrode as, an, as if it were a zero, right? as a reference, then you call this a referential um, montage, right? So they're all, the second electrode is always the same, all right? So it's in FP1 with CZ, F3 with CZ, F7 with CZ. So always, this is important, okay? You see why. So this is bipolar, sequential. They're both act, or the first and the second electrodes are, are active. And here, let's say the second electrode is always inactive. Of course, it's not but it's as if it were, right? So you have different montages, right? This one is with every, everybody on one side on this year and everybody on the other side with this year. It's A from auricular, but we don't use this one too much because there are lots of um, interference. Okay, so now the engineers are going to have some fun, right? Because you've got two, remember I said there are two inputs and one output. The first input is a full line. The second input is a dotted line and one output. So what happens? Thank you, engineers, if there's anyone listening, because they have made the, the equipment so, so that when the first electrode, the first input, grid one, is negative, and the second, therefore, is more positive, you're going to have a deflection from negative to positive goes up and on the contrary the other way if it goes if it's the first one is positive it's going to go from positive to negative so it goes down why is this okay so I've, this is the <clears throat> example that now you're going to understand let's see frontal central and parietal so uh, channel one goes down which means the second electrode is more negative okay from positive to negative but now he was the second electrode, but now he's going to be the first one, right? Dotted line, full line. So now if the most negative is the first one, it's going to go from more negative to more positive. So what you have here is a phase reversal because here he was the second electrode and now he's the first one, all right? And this, so this phase reversal, when it closes, shows that an activity is negative. And if it opens, it's positive. If you didn't understand, never mind. Every time it closes, it's negative. When it opens, it's positive. <clears throat> and if you use a referential montage, right? The, the R would be the whatever reference would be a zero. Only the central electrode is more negative, right? So it will go from negative to positive, and or from positive to negative, 
if it's uh, more positive. All right, so there it makes it really easy now, right? So you've got the brain area, frontal pole, frontal central parietal occipital, FP1, F3, C3, P3, O1, right? And so the events, C3 is negative, okay? So what happens between this one and this one? No difference. Between F3, uh, F and C, F, C, sorry, is more negative. So it goes from positive to negative. Now C is the first one and it's more negative than P. So it goes from more negative to more positive and you have the phase reversal. And if it's uh, the um, referential program only, this one is more negative, so it will go from more negative to more positive. So every time it goes up in a referential program, you call it, you say it's negative, okay? And some people only do the electroencephalogram, they only use the referential program, so you can be sure that every time it goes up, it's a, a focus, an epileptic focus, because it's negative. Okay, and what happens here? Between F3 and C3, C3 is more negative, right? Between C3 and P, no difference, right? They're, they're equipotent. And between P and uh, occipital, uh, P is more negative than the occipital. So what's going on? And if it's positive, it's the contrary. So what's going on? Either these two electrodes are so close that um, they're registering the same thing, which we would call a... Uh, uh, ponchi, right? Um, or they have they, they are equidistant to uh, to a foci, right? And here the same thing. Look, C three and P three relative to um, to referential have the same the same deflection, the same distance. So what happens is that is what uh, we were thinking here. C three and P three they are equidistant from the most negative point, right? So they have the same electronegativity. That's why there, um, there's no, no, no deflection here. So what can you do? Okay, this is the 1020 system. Let's use the 1010 system, right? Let's put one more electrode, right? Okay, so now you have between this one and this one, this one is, is a little bit more negative only 20 microvolts between this one and this one. This is really more negative, right? And this, uh, between this one and this one, this one is more negative. So you have the phase reversal and between this one and this one, only a little bit. This is what we call the field, right? Because when you, um, what I had, had shown before, it's an electrical field or we call it campo eléctrico. I think it's the same. In Spanish, right? So where it's very electronegative is where you have the phase reversal. And the others are just the tip of uh, what's happening. And this is important because when you have, when it's, uh, it's something biological, when it's something from the brain, it usually has a field, right? Not only one group, one electrode is going to be uh, negative, but the ones beside it too. Um, well, and if you use the referential program, remember C3 point was more negative than C3 and P3. So the deflection is going to be larger because the difference of voltage is larger. So here, what counts? When you have a bipolar program, what counts is the phase reversal. And when you have a, a referential program, what counts is the deflection, the height, right? How big it is, the biggest, the more negative. Okay, now let's see here. F3 is much more negative than the rest, but I do not have a phase reversal here, okay? Well, what if I could put one more electrode here? Exactly, see what happens? I put one more electrode and I can see that F3 is where the phase reversal is. Sometimes you don't have another electrode, okay? It would be this. So you know that when it points outwards, that you could have another electrode. This is where it's most electronegative in this montage. And if you put it in the um, referential, F3 is going to be more negative than FP1 and FC3 in uh, relative to the, the referential. So what counts is right here in the bipolar, what counts is the phase reversal. And in the referential, what counts is the height, okay? The highest, the most negative. Okay, now you know the basis of everything, right? So let's show here. 
I've got some, I've got a program, right? This is the double banana. So red is uh, left and right is um, blue. And I've got parasagittal, temporal, parasagittal, temporal on the midline, right? So what's the difference between one another? So let's see, let's try. This is the same on bipolar. Where is the phase reversal? Is it here or is it here? So this would be, the phase reversal would be an F7, right? Because it's FP1, F7, F7, uh, T, T7. Okay, so this is this, the, the same electrode. So this is where it's most electronegative. But I don't know if it's more electronegative here or here. So what do I do? I can put a referential program, see which one is highest. So it's F7, right? Uh, sorry, F7 and T7. T7 is more, is higher, right? So now I go back and I know that T7 is where the phase reversal is. Is where it's more electronegative, I mean. Okay, what else? You can do the transver transversal bipolar, right? So here I've got F1, F2, then I've got one side comparing the other, right? These compared to these, the frontals, then the... Um, the central, right, CZ is in the middle, central one side, central the other side, then parietal, parietal, right? So I can I just put the color so you can compare one side to the other. And where is it more electronegative here? It's the same patient, right? C7, a little bit on P7, and also FP1. So it's, it's like seeing something from different angles, all right? It's always the same thing, but as if you were analyzing from different angles. So here you have an example, right? Here you've got the phase reversal. If I put um, a transverse program, it's going to show right here it was, which is the most electronegative here, uh, F7, T3, right? Both of these. And here, look, F7, and T3, the same ones, it's the same, same place. And if I put the referential program, oops, with PZ in this case, F7, T3, and T5. So F7 and T3 are the most electronegative, right? It's all the same, same thing, but seen from different uh, perspectives. So this is very old electroencephalogram, but it's very good because um, it's not so so easy to see this kind of um, manifestation. So what we have, okay, everything here is impa, odd number, so it's the left side. And everything here is the right side, and this is the middle line. So what do I see here? Look, O1, occipital, O2, you've got that lovely alpha rhythm, right? You've got some fast activity, that's probably muscle. But when I go to the other side, look what I have, right? I've got this. Phase reversal, one, two, three, right? Interictal activity at least four times. And where's the phase reversal? Let's see. F4, C4, C4, P4. Who's the common electrode? C4. So this is where the phase reversal is. And also, so this is the parasagittal strip and now the temporal strip, right? Sequence. And where is it most electronegative? Here, F8, T4, T4, T6. So C4, okay? And besides this, um, electronegative activity, which is um, epileptiform, because you see it has a it has a field. It doesn't stay only in one place. There's a field. Uh, you also have these slow waves here. You see, this is right on T4, which would be the mid temporal, showing that this this temporal lobe is not only having epileptic discharges, but is already suffering because it's already slowing down. Okay, so you can see that it's 10, 10, 37, and we go 10, 10, 37. What have we changed? We changed the program. So it's the same electrodes, but all with CZ as the second as a referential. So here's the alpha rhythm, really nice. And then you have, look, C4 and P4 and T4. Which one is biggest, T4 or C4? More or less the same, right? And look at the slow waves here. So this is the referential program. Um, then you can have, uh, this is the, the tiaras, right, the transversal. It's not so good because I'm going to compare this side with this side, this one with this one, but it shows that there's a phase reversal here on C4. T4 was lost, right, and you also see a little bit in P4, and this is 
occipital, right? O1 with O2, you have that lovely alpha rhythm because the patient has her eyes closed. Okay, so the, why is it that sometimes we use one program or the other? So here's the bipolar program, and I think there's, there's a, there are a few slow waves here, but I'm not so sure. So once I put it on a referential program, they look bigger because the distance is bigger, so I can clearly point out that these slow waves do exist on the left side comparing to the right side. Okay, so let's say I've got a posterior focus, right? It's this one, okay, I just made it a little bigger here. So where is the phase reversal here on the left? Here, right? T7, P7, P7, O1. Okay, so it's parietal on the temporal line. Okay, what, what, so the phase reversal is in P7, okay. And when I put it on referential, what happens? Look, P7 and T7, which one is highest? Right, it's P7, so that's where it, the greatest electronegativity is. Oh, these, by the way, these are just blinking movements, okay? They're artifacts, right here, blinking movements. We're gonna talk about that later. And here, for example, this is a patient that has a left hemisphere lesion. Bipolar, I think that maybe it's, the, it's a little bit more suppressed, but when I put it on referential, clearly there are more slow waves on this temporal lobe than on uh, the right temporal lobe. Then here, I have, uh, this is uh, bipolar, right? So I'm not sure if the discharges are here, see, the phase reversal, or if they're here, look, there's a phase reversal here too. So when I put it on referential, obviously they are better seen on the left side. Okay, so I'm sure that the discharges are on the left side. And, well, this is the last, this is where I met William, right? We shared a, a, a room for some time and got friendly, and this is the Institute of Psychiatry. So here, I know this part is very boring, it's very insipid, but it will get better, I promise. <laughs>